Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. Welcome to Stock Sense's first webinar of the year. Tonight we will be discussing all things sheep and goat biosecurity. Um, thank you so much for joining. So just a little bit about Stock Sense. So we are a project that is run by the Victorian Farmers Federation, VFF, and we are funded by the Cattle Compensation Fund as well as the Sheep and Goat Compensation Fund. Um, we were established to be a producer-led um, livestock extension and engagement project to improve animal health and welfare and Victoria's biosecurity status. So that's largely what we do. Um, we do educational workshops, webinars just like these. We do create some fact sheets and there is industry material that we do disseminate kind of uh, pretty widely through social media. We have e-newsletters. Um, and then other things as required in recently the FMD, we were one of the first people to respond and provide any sort of, um, apologies, uh, any sort of substantial body of work on that. So we do do things, we are fairly responsive and we're very engaged with livestock producers around the state. Um, just in regards to feedback, as we are a producer led um, project, uh, your feedback is very important to us at the end of this webinar. We will be asking you um, via survey link that should come up. We'll be asking you for your feedback, what you want to hear, and just a few other questions. It would be really beneficial for us if we could please get that information. And then we can use that to sort of make sure that we are giving livestock producers in the state the best information that they have and making sure that it's all relevant and things that you actually want to hear. So moving on to the webinar. Oh, sorry, staying in touch. This is how you can contact us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Twitter and Instagram, we're at VFF Stock Sense, and Facebook, we're at Stock Sense. If you want to email us as well, stocksense at vff.org.au, or just screenshot them now and shoot us a shoot us an email or a tweet or a DM. Um, upcoming events. So we will be in Hillsville Saturday, the fourth of March, and then we will be doing. Um, an event prior to the Wimmera Field Days, as well as being at the Wimmera Field Days. We'll also be at Farm World. Um, and then March and April, you see a lot of us that will be doing, you know, a few workshops um, in Eastern Victoria. For further information and for um, the dates and that kind of thing, please go check out our website. That was back here, vff.org.au forward slash stock sense. Um, so tonight's webinar. We have three great speakers. Really looking forward to um, you hearing from everyone. First up, we'll have Dr. Rob Barwell, who will be discussing goat map, and I do believe a little bit on sheep map. Uh, he's from Animal Health Australia. And then we will have Dr. Beren Skyer from AgVic, who will be discussing, and I've had to write this down because apologies, I can never pronounce it, caprine arthritis encephalitis and Johan's disease. And then we have Jack Briscoe discussing EAD standards and guidelines. So some great speakers, looking forward to it. Um, and then that's enough for me. And I'm gonna hand it over to Rob now. Thank you so much. Thanks Molly and the team at uh, Stock Sense for having me on this evening. Hopefully I've managed to click that o over okay. That's anyone's faces now. Yell out if that's not obvious. Um, so yeah, look, I'm the head of program biosecurity at Animal Health Australia, and um, yeah, I, I actually I've made this a little bit broader than just goat map, although that's probably got um, more of the content in in my presentation. Um, so just quickly for those that don't know who Animal Health Australia is, uh, we're an independent national animal health body in Australia, bringing together government and industry to deliver animal health and biosecurity. So um, we have 33 members, I think it is at the moment, which is all the state, territory and commonwealth governments, most of the main livestock industries, uh, that's 14 sort of members in that category, including the peak livestock industry bodies, uh, including those for sheep, wool and goats. We have some service provider and associate members. Um, our mission is informing government and industry about national action required and delivering solutions together that enhance, strengthen and protect the animal health and biosecurity system. 
with a mouthful. So, um, yeah, the market assurance programs or MAPS, as we tend to use the acronym fairly freely, first of the MAPS appeared in the late 1990s and were considered a significant part of the large Yoni's disease management and control programs for nearly 20 years. Uh, those large national programs have, um, that have ceased generally, um, with, have been replaced by more broader biosecurity type um, initiatives, particularly at Excuse Animal me, Health Rob, Australia. I'm so sorry to do this. Can I just get yep. you to please share your screen? Sorry, it hasn't come up yet. Oh, really? Apologies. Oh. Hang on. Thank you. Apologies. Ah. <laughs> sorry, everyone. I said I couldn't see uh, anyone's faces. I wasn't sure whether that was working or not. Hopefully that's better. Can you see that? Yes, yep, perfect. Yep, that's great, thank you. Thanks. Um, yes, so yeah, the market insurance programs. Um, so yeah, the, the, those larger programs have um, ceased, but the market assurance programs are still in place. Uh, originally we had cattle, sheep, goat, and alpaca maps in place. Uh, then been managed by Animal Health Australia and they've generally been administered by the states. Um, some of you may know that um, the cattle program, Cattle Map, um, was closed in 2016 and the cattle industry now are using uh, Yoni's Beef Assurance scores and Dairy JD scores um, instead of the, the market assurance program while the alpaca industry has chosen to focus on some other biosecurity programs and have also closed alpaca map recently. So the aims of the maps, um, or the aim of the maps is to provide a source of low risk replacement animals for those flocks or herds who want to avoid introducing JD infection, reduce the risk of JD being spread via shows and sales, uh, maintain a reservoir of low-risk animals um, for those existing map uh, flocks and herds, and to allow. So the uh, final point here is more probably for the sheep map flocks, but um, for allowing flocks in the JD and endemic areas to demonstrate the status so that they can sell breeding or flock replacement animals uh, with more confidence around JD. So um, yeah, just a quick touch on, on sheep map, um, uh, the other existing one. It's um, so not a guarantee that if you're participating in it, that the flock is 100% uh, assured of being free of Yoni's disease, but the higher the status uh, the flock is, the more, the greater the assurance that there is that it's not infected. Um, so those statuses are called monitored negative one, two, and three, or denoted as an MN one, two, or three. Flocks maintain their status by uh, fecal testing, or there is a uh, option of choosing to maintain status with vaccination with the JD vaccine for sheep, get air. Uh, if they do use that, then there's a V used in the um, uh, when you're writing down the status. For those herds, uh, flocks wanting to progress, there's a, um, a sample or a whole flock test uh, that's done instead. Um, under this program, obviously biosecurity is vital. Uh, it's very hard to maintain um, a, a, a JD, well, a high assurance flock without having good biosecurity in place. There's a need to work with a MAP approved veterinarian and a list of those can be found by the Animal Health Australia website and uh, those vets will be involved with annual veterinary reviews in the program as well as any testing that might be occurring. So goat map, uh, it, it had a, a, a very significant review um, in 2019, 2020 and there was a decision made by the Goat Industry Council of Australia to keep it in place as well as include caprine arthritis, encephalitis, CAE. So the original goat map was split into two new modules, goat bio and JD map. 
PERT bio is the baseline biosecurity required before any disease modules are completed. Um, but it should also complement other biosecurity programs that people might be participating in, such as livestock production assurance. So I know that plenty of people might be participating in that one. And so if you're using forms, then it makes sense to be using those for both programs. Again, uh, similar to sheep map, herds um, need to undertake those biosecurity requirements. So uh, goat maps at a baseline module, then they advance or maintain status through testing. And again, there's the monitor negative one, two, and three um, levels. And the year that a herd attains, the status is reported as well. Fox um, maintain their status by fecal or blood testing or vaccination with GIDAIR. JD or uh, fecal or blood testing. Um, vaccination with GIDAIR is again a, a possible option, although I would say rarely used in the same way as it might be with the sheep. Um, the uh, goat industry has made one significant change, I guess, compared to the sheep map other than that additional module, and that is that map vets do not need to be map approved. Although these, uh, the vets vet that are MAP approved will obviously be well placed to provide this service. And again, uh, annual veterinary reviews are a part of the program. So we then have the new CAE MAP module, which aims to identify, protect, promote herds that are at low risk, that are low risk of being infected with the CAE. Uh, it is based on herd testing to detect infection and property and herd biosecurity management that minimizes the risk of introducing and spreading CAE into the herd. Again, um, you need to do that goat bio module first before uh, do it, undertaking the JD map module. Now I should say those um, herds that were already in uh, goat map previously, obviously they uh, have been essentially doing the goat bio and JD map. So, um, essentially have trans transferred across to, to uh, these two modules. But CAE map obviously is a completely new one that needs to be undertaken. The um, in CAE map herd testing is used to assess the likelihood of infection being present in the herd. And this may be achieved by individual animal testing or by regular testing of bulk milk for dairy herds. So there's two testing pathways. Uh, so yeah, non-milking herds can only achieve accreditation through what's called a herd test, the individual animal or milk ELISA pathway, whereas dairy herds may choose between this or the bulk milk test pathways. This follows research carried out on this form of testing by Elizabeth MacArthur Agricultural Institute at New South Wales DPI. Um, and again, after the series of tests are done, um, status is obtained. Uh, in this case, it's an MN1 or two. There's no three as there is for the JD map. And the year of ending the program is also reported. So the example given there is CAE MN1 2022. Um, details of which animals to test, when and how often are all included in the module. So, how do you get there to find that information? Um, all, all the re relevant documentation is available through the URLs. Uh, there's a QR code at the end of the presentation if people want to use that instead. This um, it includes manuals and modules as well as checklists and forms. Uh, there's just a few mandatory forms that are required to be used with the programs. There are a raft of others that are available to be used and um, unless a similar one has already been used for some other purposes, as I said before, uh, LPA being one example. And look, just to wrap up, I thought I'd quickly touch on some of our other biosecurity related programs at AHA before Beren um, gives you her uh, biosecurity and disease update. Biosecurity, fun biosecurity websites, all biosecurity related information, wealth of information. And if you haven't already come across the Parabos website, it's everything you need to know about internal and external external parasites for sheep and goats. So get on there and have a look at that one. And um, we have another number of other projects with goat and sheep industries, including the National Sheep Health Monitoring Project. 
And with that, I'd just like to thank you again for listening in. And I think questions are at the end, but um, Molly, unless you wanted to do some now. No, I, well, this one's kind of a big body, so I was going to uh, float it to you now. Um, and thank you so much for that presentation, Rob. That was great. Um, what percentage of producers are using sheep goat map? Do we have the statistics around that? So goat map is easy. It's quite low. It's one of the reasons the program was reviewed and why um, yeah, the changes have been made and hoping that the inclusion of CAE uh, will lead to a greater participation in the program. Um, sheep map, uh, it's, um, I might just stop that there. Sheep map is, uh, look, I couldn't give you an exact percentage, but it's mostly used by um, the st you know, studs. There probably wouldn't be many commercial flocks that are using it, um, but at least if you can find all those participating in uh, both the programs um, via the Animal Health website. So there's a database, a public searchable database there where you can access all those participating flocks in um, your state. Um, but yeah, again, uh, I couldn't give you a percentage, but it, you know, it's not huge numbers, but it's particularly uh, dominated by the stud sector. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. Really appreciate it. Um, and Beren, now it's, um, we'll pass to you. Thank you. Can you see that screen okay, Molly? Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Baron Squire. I'm the Goat Health Veterinary for Officer, Goat Health Veterinary Officer for Agriculture Victoria, and I've also got a small wall goat herd in Northern Victoria. So my talk is based on sheep and goat biosecurity with an emphasis on um, peperon arthritis and cephalitis and Yoni's disease, so CA or JV. So what is biosecurity? It's, it's a set of management practices designed to reduce the risk of introducing disease onto your farm. So it's protecting your livestock, your farm, your industry and you. So there are national strategies and on-farm practices the national strategies are common throughout all the different states, but the on-farm practices are what you can really do. Um, so what you can do is isolate your livestock, obtain and keep both the legal and voluntary paperwork that you get when um, purchasing livestock, keep your fences in good repair, control feral species. If you've got contractors or other people coming on their vehicles and machinery, inspecting those to make sure that they're not bringing on weeds, seeds or things. Have those visitors or contractors come off another farm without disinfecting or cleaning their machinery or their vehicles. Do you yourself change or wash your boots when you've gone to another farm or sale yards? Do you have different clothes when you go and help your neighbour down the road with their sheep or goat work to what you wear with your own animals? So what are we trying to avoid? The diseases we're really trying to avoid are ones like Yoni's disease, CAE, foot rot, lice, scabbing mouth, resistant internal parasites, ovine brucellosis, noxious weeds, and zoonotic diseases. Um, sorry, my mouse is, is playing up big time. And I'm going to... People. So what are notifiable diseases? They're just animal diseases that when suspected by the owners, vets, or laboratories must be reported within a defined time, time frame. So these diseases on the screen are ones in Victoria that are notifiable in just some of them in sheep and goats that are required to be notified within seven days. There's an option of being either the 1800 number, the disease hot watch hotline. That number is always answered. Uh, whether during business hours by the customer service center or after hours by a designated duty veterinary officer or you can notify by an app that's available the notify now app 
So why do you quarantine for 30 days? It's, it's recommended to quarantine for 30 days so that you can test for diseases, you can test and treat for worms and retest to make sure if they did have worms, the drenches that you use actually worked. You can check for external parasites and give two treatments for life if needed. Um, you can trim toes and check for foot rot, check the coats of weed seeds, and it enables the, the animals to adjust to you, your routine, your feed, and your climate. So with CAE, CAE is otherwise known as Capronothritis encephalitis. It's a small ruminant lentivirus. Um, overseas in sheep, the disease very similar is called meaty visna. Fortunately, we haven't yet seen that in Australia, but there's a lot more people co-grazing sheep with goats. Um, it's spread mainly by colostrum milk and saliva. It's notifiable in Victoria. There's no known cure, but with hygienic management and testing and culling of positive animals, the disease can be controlled, maintained, managed and eradicated from the property. So you can see with the goats in these pictures, you've got, some of them have got the swollen knees, some don't, they've got difficulty walking. All of them have lost weight and are quite skinny. So it's spread mainly through the ingestion of infected milk, either by kids or adults. So adults can be can become infected by exposure to infected milk droplets during milking. With goats in close confinement, it can be spread by respiratory, saliva, or tears. Transfer can sometimes occur by the blood on equipment such as your vaccination needles, your guns, tattooing, ear taggers, foot carers, or open wounds. It can be spread by mating or from um, mother to the progeny, to the kids, but it's less likely, but can occur. So basically any contact with any body, body fluid with positive CAE goats, either directly or indirectly can spread the disease. So what you see is arthritis with lameness, can get swollen knees. So the goat that up there is very skinny. It's got very swollen, knobbly knees. You can see mastitis with a harder udder, pneumonia. I know I've not seen it for a number of years in Victoria, but um, looking at the laboratory reports, there were nervous signs with the encephalomyelitis seen in kids. Overseas, there are has been seen nervous signs in adults. So if you do have CAE in adults with nervous signs, consider also getting the brain sample for under the TSC exclusion program because whilst the TS uh, Transmitted School Smodiform Encephalopathy Program, which looks for mad cow and scrapie in cattle and sheep, with sheep brains of um to the producer suitable animal sample, the brain um the producer gets hundred dollars for that. Unfortunately Goat brains aren't worth anything yet, but at least the vet gets $100 towards doing the paperwork. So that might come off the bill from doing a necropsy. And you can sometimes do, um, do the necropsies under what's called a significant disease investigation program. So you can see other things like um, finding out what causes the issue in the goats at that time. One of the major things is weight loss as well. That this disease is production limiting with welfare issues. If you do happen to have it on your farm, consider the welfare aspects of the long term quality of life of the goats and their quality of life and any pain and suffering that they may be experiencing. So, with CAE, Sometimes you get questions like, I've bought this goat, I've tested it, it's quarantined, it's positive. I've euthanized it. How long before I can put other animals in that paddock? With CAE, um, studies have shown probably about six to seven days, but we recommend at least 14 days because 14 days is the time period for foot rot um, because you don't, that animal may have had other diseases as well. And it, Quarantine in the pasture for that time period is, is more beneficial if you can't leave that area without livestock for 30 days. 
So testing for CAE, you've got the option for bloods when they're over six months of age. Now there is, can be a wide difference in price between the laboratories that we use just for the labs. So depending on the numbers of animals that we've got to test, ask your vet to get a couple of quotes to find out what is economical, more economical for you. The vet needs to handle the bloods carefully to reduce the risk of false positives, false negatives. You don't sample animals that are ill unless it is for disease diagnosis, not within a month pre or post kidding and not within the four weeks post vaccination. There is now also a milk test for CAE, whether it's individual on a vat or a vat, and that's mainly used for monitoring for the herd. Whether if any of you ever previously had dairy cattle, um, it's sending samples off similar to what they did with EBL. EMAI are the ones that can supply the sampling containers and they're the ones that do the testing. When you initially get the goats, if they're not come from a whole herd that has been tested negative regularly, and it's just an individual test being tested, make sure that you test that animal regularly as part of your herd. Because the way that the virus works, at the time the blood testing was actually taken, it may not be antibody positive because there's a delay between exposure and the development of the antibodies by the animal. And definitely don't forget to test weathers and bugs because I see a lot of tests where they've just done the milking herd or the does. Because unfortunately, bugs tend to get very, very smelly at certain times of the year. So with Animal Health Australia has some good information on their website, a fact sheet about CAE, and they've also got a program with snatch rearing on how you, if you are unfortunate to get the disease, how you can snatch for the kids and free weaning kid management to try and control and get rid of the disease. So the big thing is that there's a welfare issue with it, pain and weight loss, decreased milk production and reduced quality of life. There's no cure, no vaccine. For those of you that do have pets that are valued members of the family and whether that do have the disease, please talk to your vet about options for pain relief and supportive care to try and give them some better quality of life than being affected by arthritis too much. The next main disease that I got asked to talk to on was Yoni's disease. This, you can see this picture here, and sorry, I should have done a disclaimer at the start of it, but there are maybe some photos that might be daunting to people or disconcerting. I tried to make sure that I didn't have too many of those. But the goat on the right, she's a British Alpine. She's lost a fair bit of weight. It was unresponsive to any ventures. And towards the end, you can see that she's starting to scour. She's got um, scouring on the back of her fecal standing on her back end and on the back of her box. With the photo of the intestines, those lymph nodes, you can see the person's hands in there with the gloves, those lymph nodes are about 10 times the size they are normally. You can see that there's no internal fat and the intestines are very moist, glossy and thickened. The only disease, has, it's mainly spread by feces. It can be, if you've just bought a place, it could be on your property from somebody prior to you. You can buy it in with infected animals, fecal or water runoff from neighboring or upstream properties. Um, I know in the 2010-2011 floods, I had herds in the district I was covering that that area, sheep herds in that area, that prior to the floods, they were in the market assurance program. 12 months later to the floods, because of all the silt and the dirt from properties within the water catchment that was washed into the property, they could no longer be part of the market assurance program because they weren't having clinical signs of Yoni's disease. And there's also an aspect with when you're buying in feed, 
depending on um, a lot of producers now ask that the hay that they purchase in is from properties that do not have livestock. So it is the potential depending on how the hay is cut and harvested. For if it's being grazed at a particular time with the only infected livestock, for that fecal matter to um, be wrapped up in the hay. What Yoni's disease does is that it causes thickening of the intestinal lining. So the sheep or goat can't absorb its own food and they start to utilize their own fat and muscle reserves, which leads to weight loss. So it's known as a chronic wasting disease. And you may or may not see diarrhea or, or scours, which is unresponsive to the treatment. But the big thing is that you've got redu reduction in production, whether it be fiber, with a might, um, production of wool with the sheep, milk, fiber, or meat with goats. So again, this disease is production limiting with welfare issues. Bionis disease, they previously, when people wanted to um, remove all their livestock and not have livestock on their property, that it was recommended for at least two hot dry summers. The issue with Victoria is that there's not many areas that you definitely have two hot dry summers. So you've got to think, in that interim, you can run young stock as long as they go, as long as they go by a particular age. But you've got to think long term. If you're diagnosed with Yoni's disease, look at the genetics of the sheep and the goats that you've got. Can you get those genetics back? Are the options to vaccinate and test out of the disease? Things like that. Because I have seen people over the years de-stock and then they've actually brought the disease in again, and they've lost all the genetics that they've worked over time um, to get animals that were used to their, their property, their climate, and their handling facilities. So testing for yonis, you've got bloods, and there is a big difference in the test between the labs. Same again, handle the bloods carefully. Don't sample um, animals which are ill unless it's the disease diagnosis. With feces, you can either do individual cruel. So the standard fecal culture, it takes 12 to 24 weeks. The sheep, up to 50 samples from 50 animals can go in one pot. The goats, it's up to 25 animals per quill. Unfortunately, the high throughput PCR, data PCR, whilst there are some laboratories that are doing it, it's not yet approved in goats, but there are research trials underway to test the validity of it and the number of animals per that are required for pool to have a certain ability to, to find the disease if it's present on the farm or in the animals. And then the other way is in individual necropsy with tissue, tissue and fecal culture. What happens if I get a positive JD blood results? Were there options? So the only disease is still nine to five, but it's deregulated. De in Victoria, you've got the options of do nothing, but, but it is advised to the vendors to let them, if they're not selling other than to slaughter, to advise their purchases via health declaration. If you want to test the animal that has had a blood positive, because it may be a false positive, you've got the options of doing a full necropsy of the standard Yoni's disease collection sites with tissue and fecal culture, or two negative individual standard fecal cultures of, of the suspect animal three to six months apart. If you're part of the market assurance program, and you investigate this a blood positive within one month of a positive blood result, you only need one standard fecal culture. So if you're part of the program that Rob was talking about earlier tonight, you only need to uh, do one fecal culture and you'll get that result within the 12 to 24 weeks. Otherwise, you need to do, do the two. Now, what happens if that fecal result all the necropsy of the result comes back positive. Still not a fireball, but not deregulated. The producer's got the option to do nothing. Doesn't have to test, doesn't have to vaccinate anymore, but we do advise them to advise purchases via the health declaration for status. So the purchaser can make the honest decision on whether they want to buy those livestock or not. They've got the option to test out over a six year period using whole flock herd blood or fecal sampling. 
or the option to vaccinate everything with your dare and test out five people sampling once all the animals on the property are approved vaccinates. Now, the dare, the dare vac vaccine, it is a tool to control the disease. It doesn't stop the disease, but it reduces the clinical signs in an animal and reduces over time the amount of bacteria that's shed on the property. One issue with GDAR is that GDAR vaccinated animals will return a blood positive result. So if you wanted to test out the disease and the animals are GDAR vaccinated, your only option is either fecal culture or necropsy of the animal. Now, vaccinating with GDAR does not indicate that that particular producer has infection because there are a lot of producers out there that are negative for Yoni's disease, but they vaccinate with GDAR because their clients wishes the animals to be vaccinated due to where that client's farm or their district risk is. Um, so you can some producers still do it. They put a V in a circle on the analyzed tag on the animal. So that gives you when you see that on, on an analyzed tag, that gives you an indicator that the animal has already been de vaccinated. It's a one-off vaccine. Um, the thing with if you are using the dare vaccine yourself, you have to consider the OHNS risks. Because if you self inoculate yourself, it's a minimum of at least five to six months of work. And because it's an oil adjuvant, which is the way that's designed to keep the, immune, the, the response going, in humans, the oil tends to travel and the tissues need to be cut out. And it's not nice. So it's recommended with the bear vaccine to use what's called a shrouded vaccination. So you can't self inject yourself. Now, Animal Health Australia has got fact sheets on Yoni's disease. And the big thing is, with any of this, ask questions. Ask questions of, of the people who you're um, buying them from, your vet. If you want to control both Yoni's disease and all CAE, there is plenty of information out there and it is possible to do. There are properties that have tested out of CAE and there are properties that are tested out of Yoni's disease and they, those properties still have sheep and goats without those diseases. So some of you may have seen this little picturegraph, Animal Health Australia put an, al an analogy that I used to use into a little great little photo. If you've got sheep and goats, you need a property identification code. The ear tags, they're required for movement of your place, unless the animals are currently exempt. The national vendor deck is your legal paperwork that's required when um, selling livestock. But your sheep and goat health declarations, they're voluntary. But they're the most important piece of paper, I believe, because they tell you when the animals were last vaccinated with what, they were last infected and inspected for foot rot or lice, and when they were last drenched and with what. So the main take-home message is biosecurity is about controlling what comes onto your property and what leaves your property. So it's good management, husbandry, checking your animals and your property that you don't have strays coming on or anything like, anything like that. And that you're not actually spreading the disease when you're, you're on selling as well. So everyone has a role, no matter what size your farm is, what type of stock you've got, or how many. And for those that you were interested, um, last year when foot and mouth disease, there were a lot of talks being done on foot and mouth disease. Two photos are there, uh, photos of the lesions on the tongue, if you can see, see them there. That's actually foot and mouth disease in a goat. So goats are very subtle with their foot and mouth disease, um, ex exhibiting the diseases, whereas with sheep, you can see the lameness a lot. Goats are very subtle in having it. But thank you very much for your time. And I'll now pass back to Molly and Jack. Thank you, thank you. I'm just gonna quickly ask you one question. Uh, that's come up in the chat. When will the CAA searchable database be up and running? I am going to segue and flip past that to Rob Barber because that's in the Health Australia's role. 
perfect. Um, Rob? Nice pass, Baron. Um, yeah, look, the the back end is kind of in place and it's more around just trying to um, work out the pathway for upload of details. So um, the that should be up in the next few weeks. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. I should, just to, to add that, the goat map, um, so the previous participating goat mappers, they're up on the existing database, the map database, but the CAE in particular, this, the, the variation of the new module, that's what I was referring to. Perfect, thank you. Um, and now we'll move on to Jack. Jack, looking forward to hearing your talk, thank you. Um, Jack, you just muted, and I'll just need you to share your screen as well, please. Thank you. You're still mu you're still muted though. Yeah, perfect. You're right. go. Technology. Um, <laughs> here we go. So, can everyone see my screen or not? There. You're great, thank you. Right, okay, so we'll go on that. So thank you very much for everyone for coming on here tonight and having a listen to everyone and all the different things to do with uh, sh uh, sheep and goats. Um, so my, my angle is that I'm a livestock producer and was a contractor for 30 years um, using electronic tags before, that day, before they were mandatory in Victoria. Um, so for individual tracking. So that's where I found the importance of it all. Um, what I'll do is I'll play a short little quick video. Under the current national system, we track sheep and goats as mobs from property to property using property identification codes, PICS. Let's look at how we currently track our sheep and goats under our mob-based movement system. Meet Wooly. Wooly the sheep lives on River Run Farm with 630 others. Wooly is being moved to Wattle Downs Farm along with 400 other sheep. Wattle Downs Farm houses 1,300 sheep, including a few rams which the owner bought from a breeder. Sometime later, Wattle Downs decides to move a number of their sheep off the property. 60 sheep are sent to the abattoir, where 1,400 others have already been delivered. 75 sheep are sent to Shady Tree Farmstead, where there are already 575 head on property. 170 sheep are sent to a sale yard to be sold with 6,200 others. 500 sheep from that sale yard are moved to a feedlot, housing 8,000 more sheep. Finally, approximately 1,200 feedlot sheep are moved to an export depot where there are already 21,000 sheep. But wait, where's Woolly? Just through Woolly's potential journey, we've come into contact with about 40,280 sheep. It's at this point we find out that the rams which were brought onto Wattle Downs Farm where Woolly had been living were carrying a disease. Since we don't know where Woolly ended up, or even if she's still at Wattle Downs, we have to trace all movements of all sheep off Wattle Downs Farm through all possible paths that the disease could have flowed through. We also learned that the same breeder which sold the rams to Wattle Downs sold to 26 other properties. We now have to multiply all of these traces by 26. That's 1,047,280 potentially exposed sheep and more than 130 pathways to follow. But let's just look at finding Woolly in this instance. If Woolly had been tagged with an EID tag with a unique electronic number, we would have been able to trace her and the others from Wattle Downs as individual sheep, rather than needing to follow all the potential pathways they could have travelled down and all the other sheep they could have come into contact with. Having individual EID allows us to find Woolly. The time to contain a disease is reliant on the rate of traceability available. As a component of the whole system, EID helps us to trace specific stock and know which others have been in contact with them, improving our rate of detection, containment and response.
Right, oh, so we can see that that's um, raised in pretty important under the current part, national system. Uh, in part with it all, so. Uh, Second, yeah, I've lost my. I've just lost my. Where is it? Oh, sorry. Here we go. Um, so you can see that with the national uh, identification scheme, the main thing to remember that we're we're protecting you, you're protecting your neighbour as well as protecting the livestock industry for traceability because. With that, the reasons for traceability is pretty important with the emergency disease control, the food safety aspect of it all. So to be able to um, to sell our food on, uh, to control endemic disease, animal welfare is a big one, which you'll see in the next slide. And most importantly, market, market access, because once a disease comes in uh, like foot and mouth, um, you can see that uh, even welfare can even the welfare cull of animals that didn't have the disease but they were in the zones close to where the animals were uh, affected. There was two and a half million animals that were slaughtered. So the biggest biosecurity risk, of course, is diversification on farms now. With uh, animal with farms not only having their uh, one breed of or one type of animal on their farm, they're uh, now trying to access a lot of different markets. Uh, so with that, we can see that here uh, the market just in one day uh, back in 2015, the sheep and cattle movements from sale yards to other sale yards as well as other states we can see the volume of uh, how many movements there are there and how how do we um, trace all these animals just with a paper trail. So this is where EID has come in really handy for it. And with our pick, you can see here that the, the all the squares represent a farm and you can see that uh, actually these two farms here have been joined under one pick. So it's uh, really easy for if the disease breaks out, that we can uh, actually map who and where everyone is and where the most of uh, most, uh, the animals are that could be affected straight away. So to have a pick on your property, uh, you can have cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, alpacas, llamas, deer, horses as well as another one, camels. Uh, another one which a lot of people don't know about that if you've got more than 50 domesticated fowls, chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, etc., cetera, uh, even more than 10 emus or ostriches, you must have a pick card um, or a pick. Uh, and then you'll get, once you get your pick, you'll get a little card like this, which a lot of people in your, have in your wallets so that you can identify yourself very quickly if you needed to. And to apply for a pick, it's really easy. Uh, you can call the Ag Vic helpline. There's a number up there, or you can apply online through this link here. Just one thing to remember in Victoria that the uh, charge for a pick is free, whereas in other states of Australia, you have to pay a charge. So just the evolution of, we've got to remember before this, uh, while we had paper trails and everything like that, especially with the cattle side of things, uh, you can see that at the start of the first slide on the left, it was basically just a tail tag, uh, which can fall off in times, uh, are unreadable, and the OH&S risk of actually trying to read those tags was very high. So that's one of the reasons why they moved to a NILS tag, which you can see there in the photo on the right, which is positioned in the offside here. Uh, here we got the vendor decks, the, the paper trail starts, which we still use today. You can see on the left, the yellow one is for cattle. In the centre, the red one is for goats. And the purple one on the right is for sheep and lambs. And that all falls back under our NILs when you log on for your database. So there's an easy way of doing it. You scan your individual tags or as a group, uh, individually as a group. 
Uh, a lot of the systems that are in place now uh, have software on phones that you can Bluetooth onto your phone. Uh, from there, you can get into your database. Uh, all you have to do is put the pick to and from and put the, uh, as you can see, there is a number up the top there, around here, you can see here the eight, uh, and, and the three and all the eights. Uh, you write that down and that can be lodged straight away into the system. Now it is up to the buyers um, to do the, um, the uh, transfer from property to property. But um, I think if it's like myself, that if you are selling, um, you want to make sure that you get those individual animals off your database. Um, so I, I'm quite happy to do it for other farmers when I'm selling my livestock. So you can see here the sheep tags here. Note that with the sheep tags, uh, with the electronic tags for sheep, uh, they can go on either ear, the off or the near, the left or the right. Uh, this one here is in the offside ear. Um, but with cattle, it has to be in the offside ear for where the panel reader is in the avatars, whereas the sheep, the main thing for them is that there is an opportunity because we don't have it on one side and one uh, and one designated colour being white for the cattle tag, we can actually represent ours in our year colour. And you can see in the bottom left hand side, you can see how the colours go down and how they roll onto the following years. Uh, one thing to note that with your animals that are on the database, if they aren't transferred off, uh, they stay on your pick for a minimum of 14 years. So tagging. So you can see on the uh, the two tags that are uh, two pictures that are on the right hand side, you can see there's a numerous amount of tags there that can be used uh, for sheep and goats. Um, you can see that they they come as wraparounds or they come as the ones like the cattle, which are a button tag. Um, positioning of the tag is the best part. And as you can see, the one we're here with the cattle tag, you can see that little nil symbol that looks like an up down, upside down Australia. That is actually where the chip is. And we'll talk more about the chips and the numbers later. But you can see that the tag is presented nice and easy. So it's easy to read. It's comfortable for the animal. And the same is with the, where the ear rolls over above that tag for a sheep uh, or goats. That's a really good spot to put those wraparound tags there. We try not to put them on the outside of the year for snagging purposes or too far into the year, which can actually cause um, some discomfort for the, sh uh, for the animal as they're walking around. One thing to note is also too, with the applicators, make sure that the tags that you buy, you use the correct applicator for them, uh, designed for those tags and those tags only. Hygiene is another one to really look at if you do use disinfectant, and we recommend that you do use this, or I recommend that you do use uh, disinfectant. Please le read the label to uh, understand the amount of uh, disinfectant that you have to use. If you go above the recommendation, you can actually uh, burn the ear um, and start what they, and you can start with some people call ear rot, et cetera, but it's like a dermatitis. Um, so make sure that you do that. Also to the, the best time to apply, make sure that it is something that is comfortable for the animal, that the animal's easy to restrain, being young and uh, smaller than being big and uh, heavier than the, the person that's actually applying the tag. Uh, so that it's easy for everyone and it's a nice, easy process. So you can see uh, here, We've got our RFID tag. The RFID means radio frequency ID, and that is the actual chip number. So you can see the first part there, the 982, is represented at the manufacturer. So that's an all-flex tag. And you can also see in the numbers that go around the outside of the tag, the X is also represented in that so that we know which animals which, uh, which uh, which producer or manufacturer produce those tags. From there, we can see that there is an actual specific number range that's unique to that tag is, is in place. So it's not the same number that's on the outside. From there, you can see your, um, now we go to the numbers that are on the outside. You can see the pick. 
there represented, being three being from a Victorian state, and you can see below there from the start of the eight characters for each other state, A and B being the Shire and the C and D being the parish and the one, two, three is where you are within that parish. From there, you can see B is represented as a cattle tag. But if you look up in the top right hand corner of the screen, you can see K is for goats and S is for sheep. Um, and you can also see the T and the L are post breeder tags. Uh, they're for tags that have fallen out from your place, the original origin of the of the sheep or, or the goats. Um, and you must put a tag in the, uh, the orange or the pink orange in cattle and pink in uh, the sheep and goats, so that it becomes um, a still a traceable item. You can see there the D, that means the year code, so you can't go and buy a heap of tags and then use them throughout the years. We try to say to use only, or try to buy the amount of tags that you are going to use for that year. And then serial, at the end, we have our serial device number. And this is what the outside, and this is what you can use with other series of matching tags, et cetera, to be able to put a visual number to it. So you don't have to walk around with a wand all the time. You can actually have that number written down. And with some of the software programs, that'll actually match back to the RFID. And there is a free bucket list, which is an Excel spreadsheet that will marry the RFID with the NILS tag. So you can see here with how does it actually work? Well, you can see that the tags, once they do go on to come onto your place, they are registered to your place as the producer, they go into the animal, and from there, they can either go to a property to property transfer through a sales transaction, sales transaction, or go straight to a feedlot. And every time, every time those animals are moved, they go into the NILS database right through to the end to the abattoirs. So you can see here, there's one way of manually doing it where they're doing it just scanning up on a race. Uh, this is the way that most producers do it at home. Uh, when you are using high volumes, uh, this is a, a larger version for cattle, but there is a smaller version, which is just the same width in between, but it is a lot lower in height. Uh, for high volume areas to be able to um, put a big throughput of animals. So once again, in Victoria, it is mandatory for sheep and goats. One of the things also too to remember that if you are from interstate here tonight, um, there is, uh, there is um, so shown now that there is a premium for animals that are interstate that have already had the Niels electronic tag put, them, put in them. So when they come in, because remember, as I said, it is the buyer's responsibility in Victoria. So if we were to buy animals from interstate, when we are then to go to transfer them off our property, we will have to put a post breeder tag in them at our cost for them to be able to leave our place. Uh, you can see here, this is another version for some goats or some breeds of uh, goats that have small ears that can't have tags. Um, you can see here that there is leg bands. I'm um, led to believe that this is a data Mars tag. Um, I've talked to Allflex yesterday and they do not have any uh, leg bands for goats at this stage. So with that, uh, with Victoria being the world leader in livestock traceability, there's also some challenges that uh, tags don't help when you try to get them to market. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Thank you to all of our speakers tonight um, and to all of our attendees. I hope you've uh, had a good time, enjoyed yourself and learned a couple of things. Uh, we will be sending out the survey at the conclusion of this webinar. Um, so if you could please all, um, if you're able, please complete that. There will be something on there about network groups. Network groups are a great way for you, the producers, to provide feedback to the Stocks and Project so that we can make sure the, the work we're doing is relevant to you, your farm, and the best outcomes for Victorian livestock producers. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Rob, uh, Baron, and Jack. You are great speakers and we've just learned so much. So can't thank you enough. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. I will let you go and have a great night. Cheers.